Folks, it's Scotland, it's Saturday, and it's 1 p.m. And that means that we're back in original form, the legible, credible, inevitable storm, which is a force for good, coming to you live from our nerve center here in the great British city of Glasgow, with me, your host, Alistair McConaughey. And we're trying something a little different on Facebook today. We're broadcasting from a different device, which is in landscape rather than in portrait. And we're broadcasting from this device to see what the sound quality is going to be like, to see what the upload speed is going to be like, to see what the picture is going to be like. We may stick with this in future, or we may move back to the other device that we're broadcasting from in the past. And we're also broadcasting on Twitter. And Twitter and Facebook are great mechanisms for us to get our message out. Nice to see Richard watching. And I want to just start, I want to just start um, by some news here that Justin, Justin about the COVID town lockdown, exclusive to a force for good. And residents of Grangemouth will be permitted this week to meet up with friends inside a laundrette, inside a sauna, or on a hot air balloon, but not at a fishmonger's or a municipal bandstand. Anyone in Somerset wishing to visit a Petting zoo will need a permission slip signed by two witnesses, unless it's a Thursday or their surname begins with N. And bowling alleys will be permitted to reopen in Kilmarnock, but only on Wednesdays between 2 and 5 a.m. And families in Great Yarmouth will be permitted eventually this week to visit their grandmothers for a game of Jenga, but not for a game of Buckaroo. OK, so that's the new rules that have come out from the British government and also from the Scottish administration this week. And actually, I'm joking, of course, and I'm also paraphrasing a rather funny article that was written by Michael Deacon in the Daily Telegraph last week. And I think he sums up a lot of that sort of thing that we've been concerned about, because it all seems as if it's just uh, not, not very clear for us at all. And something as well that we discovered this week, which I couldn't believe, but a significant proportion of the official daily death toll are people who have, in England and Wales, are people who have recovered from COVID-19 but then gone on to die of other causes. And they get included in COVID-19 deaths. Apparently, unlike in Scotland and Wales, anyone who has ever tested positive for the COVID-19 coronavirus in England and Wales counts as a COVID death, even if they die several months later. So what that says to us really is that it makes a mockery of these figures and it means that none of us are really working with figures that are in any way comprehensible or by which we can make any sort of sensible judgment whatsoever. So we have to, we're, we're in the hands here of the so-called experts and it's questionable if the experts themselves even know what to do. Well, we do have a solution which we'll get to very shortly. But that's an amazing thing to think that you get put down as a COVID death, even if you've recovered from it and you die several weeks later, tragically, in whatever way that you may happen to go. And this, this as well, this this constant, uh, this constant obsess obsessing, obsessing, obsessing with uh, this disease is it's like a luxury that we here in the West can afford because we, especially in the United Kingdom, have a welfare state. 
which protects us. And if we did not have a welfare state, the country would not have got closed down because the country couldn't get closed down because everybody would not be able to make money and everybody would be in poverty. So we, we're only closed down. There's only a lockdown here because we can do that because we've got a welfare state that can protect us and can give us that luxury of closing down and locking down and staying at home. It's the welfare state entirely to thank, if you want to say thank, for that. Now think if you're in another country in the developing world that does not have the network that we've got, the, um, the governmental structures that we've got, the economy that we've got, and how are these people in these countries meant to survive in a lockdown situation? Many, in many cases, they can't properly survive because many people, especially in the developing world, live hand to mouth day to day. They need a daily income at the market or wherever in order to um, in order to to survive. So we have to we have to uh, we have to uh, be conscious of that. And we also have to be conscious of the fact that, you know, we could be setting a very bad example, a very bad example to the to the rest of the world. And this was pointed out by Madeleine Grant in an article which I read this week. She goes, obsessing over the possibility of a second wave means the government seems incapable of computing the economic consequences of not lifting lockdown, not just in this country, but for the world beyond Europe. Because as she pointed out, many people can't survive, can't survive properly economically in lockdown in countries where there's not a welfare state. It's an exorbitant human cost of an economic downturn that will be greater with millions already below the poverty line. Millions below the poverty line being locked down in countries. And to what extent are they following the lead of privileged countries, to use that fashionable word, such as ourselves these days? We have the ability to lock down, but only because our economy and the way our society is structured enables us to lock down. So, we're not really comparing like with like. They shouldn't be following our example if they don't have a welfare state. And, you know, she went on and she said it, it may seem an odd concept at a time of creeping poverty, but there is an air of luxury, even decadence, about our lockdown obsession. It's almost a form of latter day imperialism, where countries that can afford to weather the economic storm are demanding that their model be imposed on impoverished countries, for which it guarantees catastrophe, for which it guarantees catastrophe. And how ironic, how ironic that Western liberals immersed in identity politics and check your privilege have ignored the unequal effects of lockdown on the global economy. And that's so true. And that's a good reason to get out of this lockdown situation as much as possible, because it is setting a bad example to the rest of the world, setting a very bad example to the rest of the world. And it's, it's having bad consequences here in the United Kingdom as well, because this week we learned that WH Smith has, been, has had to close down a lot of its shops, especially the ones that are in airports and are in uh, railway stations because they rely entirely upon commuters and the daily trade of the commuters coming in and out to these cities. And so the full economic impact has not yet hit. It will hit when Rishi stops his furlough for which we've all got to be uh, grateful for the moment, but that's not going to last forever. So what is the solution then, what is the solution? The solution is very simple. And we said this uh, probably back um, in the second or third broadcast, we pointed out that the human body is made to battle disease. 
It's an extremely competent organism which will protect you from almost all diseases and especially from things like uh, uh, coronavirus, which is essentially flu. OK, if you've got underlying conditions, of course, you must be careful. And the older you get, you must also be careful. But for everybody, basically, it's not going to be it's not going to be a risk. And Tim Stanley put it into words that I could not better in an article entitled Cure to Irrational COVID Fear is a Healthy Dose of Small C Conservatism. And he said this is the message that he would like to be hearing from the government today. And it should be saying something like this, and I will quote, we can take the measures we need to stop the spread. We can invest in protective equipment and research, but we cannot lock down forever. And the public cannot reasonably expect 100% protection from COVID-19. So it's over to you now, the great British public. We'll give you good information and we'll do our best to help, but we're all going to have to step outside and navigate a situation that countless generations have faced before because you know what? Disease is a fact of life. Disease is a fact of life and your body is made to combat disease. And that's the glory of it all. You know, your body is built to combat disease and we need to get, get kind of stronger about this. You know, I understand that people have to wear masks if you're on public transport or, or go into like little shops where the owner uh, insists on it out of respect. You have to do that. But in supermarkets, you don't have to wear a mask. In a supermarket, you don't have to. They're not any supermarket, they're not imposing it upon you. So if you want to go into a supermarket without a mask, you are free to do so, okay? You're free to do so. And that's what I personally do all the time. Although if I have to go into a wee shop that I know the owner's uptight about that, then I will put on a mask. But I'm not going to do it in a supermarket. And last night, and this has been bothering me, right? Last night, I'm coming out of Asda. And there's a bloke walking in, right? young bloke, maybe in his 30s, he's wearing a black t-shirt that says Heisenberg across the top of it with a picture of the Walter White character from the Breaking Bad uh, series that was on a few years ago. Now, for those who don't know, Heisenberg was Walter White's street name. And Walter White was a bad dude, okay? He was a bad dude. And he didn't take nonsense from anybody. OK, and this guy's walking in to Asda wearing a Heisenberg T-shirt, wearing like a gimp mask, you know. And I'm like, Walter White would not be wearing a gimp mask walking into Asda. OK, so why are you wearing this like Heisenberg T-shirt like you're the dude, you're the big bad dude walking in wearing a mask? That just makes you look stupid. It's like a contradiction there, a total contradiction. You know, if you're going to wear a Heisenberg T-shirt, don't be walking to Asda wearing a mask. That just annoyed me, man. It's like, I, I had difficulty sleeping last night just thinking about that. Like, wow, there's such a disconnect there, such a disconnect. So why is he wearing this Heisenberg T-shirt? What's it like? It's like compensating for something, you know. If you're going to wear a big bad dude T-shirt, walk the walk. Walk the walk. Just don't. Don't just wear the T-shirt, walk the walk as well. Anyway, that was irritating me. Something else that's been irritating me, actually, is litter. OK, now, I, it came, I thought, you know, if the government can train the population so well to behave, to stay inside, to do what they're told, to, to wear masks, to walk backwards, or whatever it is that they're going to train us to do next. How can't they train people to pick up litter or not to throw away their litter? You know what I mean? It's like, surely we could have like a six, six month program where the government really comes down on litter, bad for your health. Don't throw that can out the window. 
if you're going to leave your black bins, black bin bags on the pavement, remember to tie the top of them. Because if you don't tie the top of them, what happens is the wind comes along, blows it over, and all your used possessions get scattered down the street for your neighbours to look at. Why do people not do that? Why don't they, when they put out bin bags, why don't they tie the top of it? Because next morning, that will be all over the street. And the seagulls will have been in there and everything. And it's like they don't learn. It's like, do they think that somebody's going to come along and tie the bin bags for them? I just, some people, I don't know. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So why can't the government train us to pick up litter, not to throw litter away and to tie the tops of bin bags? Just a little thing there. Just a little thing. But actually, I'm quite, I'm quite relaxed this morning. I'm quite relaxed. I'm glad to say. Um, the sun's shining, had a run. That's when I saw the litter, by the way. So, um, yeah, that, that's uh, moving on, moving on. It's been quite an exciting week in Scottish politics, if you can use that um, adjective to describe anything that happens in Scottish politics, because the Scottish Conservative Party have got a new leader. And we are not party political, but of course we do look to see what um, we do look to see what our um, the um, what Scottish politics do, and what Labour does, and what the Lib Dems do, and what the um, Conservatives do. And the Conservatives, you know, they're the Unionist Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party, so. We especially are interested in what they've got to say. And sometimes we have been critical of them in the past, but sometimes they do good stuff. And we're critical of all parties. And we 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 um we give credit where credit is due. Now, somebody there was saying, I'm a Scot who lives in England and I'm watching. Thanks very much for coming in on that one somebody saying keep united absolutely absolutely so the new leader of the scottish conservative party uh, a young fellow uh, he may have hopefully he's got uh, good potential we would advise him to be a unionist carnivore not a unionist herbivore far too many unionist herbivores around like the snp will do something cracked and the the unions so go, oh, well, that's, that's, that's uh, you know, it's, it meant well, blah, blah, blah. No, 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 they don't mean, they don't mean well. So you've got to be a carnivore. So here are some suggestions for the new Scottish Conservative leader to get his teeth into if he is indeed a unionist carnivore. One, you have to sort out the civil service, which essentially runs Scotland and which does the bidding of the Scottish Nationalist Administration. You have to sort that out and you have to stop them from doing the bidding. Now, we're not talking here about the, the, the civil service helping to enact uh, just the, the normal day-to-day -day government of Scotland, such as when do the bins get collected and uh, how do we do the dog licensing and uh, that sort of stuff? Obviously, that's just stuff that has to be done. That's the job of the civil service. What we're talking about is when the Scottish National Party promote a separatist agenda and they hitch the civil service to do all their research. In other words, they hitch British civil service here in Scotland to figure out ways to figure out ways to destroy Britain. They hitch the civil service to separatist bandwagon in order to find out ways how to make the British civil service in Scotland essentially redundant. And during during the in the, in the run up in the run up to the 2014 referendum, they the civil service produced this book for the Scottish. National Party. It's called Fraudulent Costs, okay, which is what we call it. It's an exact anagram of 
what it was actually titled, which was Scotland's Future. That's an exact anagram of Scotland's future. Isn't that weird? Isn't that weird? Fraudulent costs. Anyway, this is a doorstopper of a book. It is um, 600, 650 pages, 650 pages. And you could say, well, nobody reads it. Well, it got sent to anybody who asked it and thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of copies were printed and went out. And that was produced by the British Civil Service in Scotland. And it's about how to destroy the United Kingdom, essentially. Now, how on earth did that happen? How on earth was it that the British Civil Service could get enlisted by the Scottish National Party to do its bidding in order to promote its separatist agenda? Well, we know exactly why that happened, and it's <clears throat> to do with it's to do with uh, the way that the so-called evolution um, settlement is constructed where everything is considered devolved except that which is written down as reserved. And of course, written down as reserved was not, don't let the British Civil Service try to destroy the United Kingdom if Alex Salmon tells them to do so. That wasn't written down, you know. So it's just considered to be devolved, considered to be devolved. And so, they did it. Now, that's, of course, the wrong way to do it. What has to happen is that that um, everything is considered reserved, everything, except that which you specifically write down as default. That's the correct way it should have been done. That's not the way that the Labour Party set it up. And we wrote an article on that, which we can, which we can post there in the comments. So we cannot allow this British civil service in Scotland to do that again. Because if, if God forbid, there were a second referendum and the British civil service is allowed to do what it did last time and is hitched by Nicola Sturgeon to do her bidding, then we cannot compete with that, okay? We cannot compete with a system that uses our taxpayers' money to produce works like this. We can't compete with that. Unionism cannot compete with that, okay? So we cannot allow British taxpayer money to be used by the civil service at the bidding of Nicola to promote her separatist agenda. We cannot allow that. And that is something that the new leader of the Scottish Tories must get his teeth into, and he must make it an issue because we here in Scotland have our own deep state and it's a very incestuous deep state and it runs through the media, through the SNP and into the civil service. And that needs sorted out because if that incestuous triumvirate, if that's the word, are allowed to do separatist bidding at a second referendum, then we're lost because we cannot compete with that kind of money that we're, we're paying for, we're paying for as well. So, somebody there saying hello from Lanarkshire. Thanks very much. Good to see people watching from all over the world today. People watching from all over the world, which is absolutely tremendous. That's the first thing the Scottish Tory leader has to do is that he has to get his teeth into the civil service and say, you should not be doing the bidding of the SNP on separatist matters. Everything else is okay, but on separatist matters, you cannot be promoting their agenda. <clears throat> the second, the second thing that they do, we've got a, an article on that. Hopefully, we can just put that, put that up there. Um, somebody also saying there that. The real things that people need to learn, that's going back to the litter, are responsibility for themselves and respect for others. Uh, absolutely. And just respect for society, you know, to be socially conscious, just to train to be socially conscious, you know. Don't, don't take your shopping trolley from Asda 
half a mile down the road and like leave it why do people do that you know i don't i don't get it that's actually stealing that's stealing yeah so yeah that's the first thing sort out the civil service the second thing the second thing is something that we spoke about last week you know we spoke about the the need the need to make the british parliament in scotland relevant again and we spoke about how if you lose the practice of something then you lose the relevancy ultimately you lose the relevancy and then you also lose the the uh, authority which comes from that so how do we make how do we make the british parliament in scotland relevant again and I, i'm going to concentrate on that at the moment and there was an article which was written in the scotsman just recently why unionists have a battle to save the uk from the SNP, written by a guy called Paris Gutsoyanis, who had been working in the Whitehall machine for many years. And he says that two decades of devolution has left much of the Whitehall machine unwilling to engage with Scotland, either through disinterest or fear. Fear. When you ask a question of any UK government department, other than the Scotland office, what drives you mad isn't that they usually don't have the answer, it's that they're often surprised to get the question at all. Long gone are the days when 10 and 11 Downing Street were both occupied by Scots. For years there has been a Scottish void at the heart of the UK government. And um, just talking about our Facebook broadcast there, I'm aware that there's a that there's trouble with it so we'll just uh, switch over entirely to the twitter broadcast now and if we could put the twitter link up on the facebook page please so they're often surprised to get the question at all so how do we make the british parliament in scotland relevant again well there is hope at the end of the tunnel because the new leader of the Scottish Conservative Party has said that he wants to devolve more powers to local councils, not to Hollywood, more powers to local councils. Now, that sounds good and it's a fairly good idea, but you have to be careful how you do it. OK, because there is a danger that by doing so, you could just double Holyrood's authority. The aim here is to make the British Parliament in Scotland, which is to say the Scottish office, the authority. It's not to allow Holyrood to be seen as the authority. So what you do is the Scottish office holds the powers and devolves them directly to the local councils. So the relationship is between the Scottish office and the local councils. It's not, it's not uh, between the local councils and Holyrood which would be the danger if you didn't specify that. OK, so you can make the Scottish office relevant again by giving it the control over the local councils, just like it used to have in the past. Devolve all sorts of powers to the local councils, but ensure that the overseer, the person at the top, is the Scottish office and not Holyrood. Otherwise, you're simply just giving more powers to Holyrood. OK. So that's an important angle to remember when we're talking about devolving powers to local councils. It has to be the Scottish office which is in charge of that. And, you know, there are signs, it's, there are signs that uh, the British government is waking up to this. Uh, for example, they've got this new Queen Elizabeth hub building in Edinburgh, which is a big step up from the cupboards that they used to hide in, in Melville Street, just a year or so back. Oh, you, you know, you'd walk in and you go, where's the Scottish office guy? And he's like, he's hidden in that cupboard over there, he doesn't want to talk to you. That was the kind of state they were at a year ago. 
or two years ago. Now they've, they're getting this hub, which they're going to be staffing hopefully with with uh, with people who are going to build up the presence of the British Parliament in Scotland once again. And a wee report in the paper yesterday says that this hub building in Edinburgh will open soon and host senior officials from Whitehall. And workers will be tasked with building links with businesses, academia and Scottish civil society. A government source said, quote, ministers are determined to be more visible in Scotland and more vocal about the work of the government. And that's so important. And even we saw uh, Rishi Sunak came up yesterday to the Isle of Butte for some reason. I'm not quite sure why it was the Isle of Butte, but he came up. And of course, you had this like this like loud mouthed elderly uh, person with an a EU flag like following him around. Well, it's like what we said a couple of weeks ago. When are the people in Butte? And I'm sure there's two or three unionists up there going to pull out the Union Jack and go, yes, Rishi, good man, you know, and counter and counter that display of Scottish nationalism is easily done. And if you want to get your face in the newspaper, it's guaranteed. It's guaranteed because the the the, the media love, they love somebody that's w waving a flag, you know, they'll always take a picture of it. And so you have to be, you have to be prepared for that. You have to be prepared for that. And um, on that on that topic, actually, of waving a flag, somebody made a really good comment to us last week when we talked about this. They said, at this time of trouble with the Nats, everyone who loves Britain should have a union flag in their home, ready to use at a moment's notice. You never know when you might want one. We're not living in days when you can take the things we love for granted anymore as in the past, before the SNP separatist resurgence. Don't be stuck saying, well, I love Britain, but I don't actually have any symbols to tell people that I love Britain. So that's where we come in. That's where we come in. We are able to help you prepare physically. We sell our, our uh, special three by two Union Jack flag, which is custom made, custom made, and it's got a hem, here, which is open, which you can put in your your stick or bamboo cane to fly it. And you can get that on our shop, in our shop, on our website, aforceforgood.uk, aforceforgood.uk. And we also sell, we also sell umbrellas, which are on a rainy day. These are, these are better than flags on a rainy day. These are really colorful, really big, really powerful, and you will get your photo taken and it will appear in the newspaper, believe me. So you can get the umbrellas as well in our in our shop, okay, at aforceforgood.uk. And of course, we're also selling our flag here in badge form, enamel badge with the union heart, which says a force for good through the middle of it. The King James the Sixth. Union Jack flag, as well as these, which people buy in in large numbers. These, that's a another enamel Union heart, which is a force for good through the middle of it. And you say, Alistair, why uh, are you giving us the sell here? Because you know we're not we don't run on fresh air. Okay, we need to do everything that we do. To do everything that we do, we need a very small amount of money. A very small amount. And it's not, uh, we don't have anybody that's on any kind of big salaries here. We just have small retainers for people who, who work and do um, the vital stuff, such as graphic design and doing our amazing Twitter, which is going to get 30,000 views, by the way. So if you retweet, sorry, 30,000 followers, 30,000 followers, if you retweet this broadcast, we will retweet your tweet to 30,000 people. That's a good deal. That's a 360 win, a 360 win. We also spoke there about preparing yourself physically. You can also prepare yourself mentally by reading anything that we do at aforceforgood.uk and also purchasing our bestseller, WeBook for the Union, 
a wee book for the union, which is a 56 page pocket book, perfect bound, full color, and it takes it, it through from the beginning from 5,000 years ago when the social and cultural unions began. Okay, uh, right up to today, explaining the benefits of the U how we came together, the benefits of the UK, exposing the indie myths and the future, making a better Britain. So please do check out your wee book for the union. And if you can put the link up to that in the in the comments and we'll we'll fire that around so the um yes going back to the tory leader sort out the civil service build up the scottish office again by doing local devolution properly use the the new queen elizabeth hub in order to promote in order to promote Britishness and the Union, and thirdly, thirdly, um, help to explain how funding, how the funding mechanisms work here in Scotland, because it's extremely obscure. Now, one of the really good arguments for the British Union is the sharing of resources and the the sharing of um, of money throughout the United Kingdom so that some parts get get subsidized by the richer parts. And that's a really valuable thing, but nobody really knows how that works unless you look it up and unless you try to figure out that money's going there because it came from there or whatever. It's all quite convoluted and it's really quite hard to explain. And the, the, the closest any kind of branding comes is something called the Barnett formula. Now, think about how boring that phrase is, the Barnett formula. Right, so you look this up, and apparently Mr. Barnett was a functionary in the Callaghan government in 1976 to 1979, okay? Well, who was he? What did he do? And that was like a long time ago, and we're still calling one of the most important things that exist in our United Kingdom, this obscure phrase, the Barnett formula. Now, we have to, we have to lose that sort of... Um, those words and we need to get a proper branding for the way that money comes up and benefits us all and read a really good article this week uh, called um now is the time to combat scottish nationalism by dr graham goodgen uh research associate at uh, the university of cambridge and he pointed out exactly what i'm saying to you and he said, what we need to be calling it is we need to have new branding and we need to call it something like a UK cohesion fund, which is which is a good name. On the, It says it, it um, does what it says on the tin. You know, you can see, right, this fund is for the United Kingdom and it's for cohesion in the United Kingdom. So it's like, oh, yeah, I get that. That's that's quite a good term, UK cohesion fund, certainly better than the Barnett formula. Uh, another phrase would be the UK Prosperity Fund, which is a fund for the United Kingdom to make it prosperous. We prefer that to cohesion because cohesion is it's not really a word that you would normally use, but you need to change the branding to get that right. And then you need to clarify and make more transparent how the funding works, because most of us do not understand where the money's coming from. You know, this very valuable uh, policy that we've got is very difficult to explain. And if you can't really explain it, then people can't understand it, they can't remember it, and they can't repeat it to their colleagues. So all of that needs to be simplified, simplified, simplify the funding mechanisms so that people can understand them, remember them, and repeat them, and use them, and use them in order to promote the benefits of the United Kingdom. Okay, a cohesion fund, a, a UK prosperity fund, simplify so that we can explain and so that we can take this out there and we can we can fight the good fight with all our might. Fight the good fight, believe what is right, as that song which led us in earlier said. 
Now, I noticed somebody there asking a, a question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just pointing back out what we we're talking about earlier about how you can't understand the mentality of people who litter their own lives, litter their own roads, litter the pathway into their own house. It's, 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 it's weird. It's weird. Is it just laziness? And, and, and saying also good exposure of the unhealthy relationship between the civil service here in Scotland and the SNP. And absolutely, in our wee book, we made this point as one of our 23 policies to strengthen the union. And we said, build up the Scottish office. But we also said, use the civil service to promote British unity and stop it being used to push separatism. Because the extent to which the British civil service in Scotland is funded by the British taxpayer and enlisted by the SNP to promote the breakup of Britain is a very serious concern. Very serious concern. It should not be happening. It's like an enemy force within the United Kingdom actively working to separate Scotland from the rest of the United Kingdom. So on anything to do, on anything to do with separatist policies, the British civil service here in Scotland should not be involved. It should be written into their code of conduct in some way that breaking up the United Kingdom is not part of their job, not part of their job. And that has to be clear because, as I said, if we go into a second referendum, God forbid, with the civil service on the side of the SNP effectively, then we're lost. I mean, we're lost. There's no question about it. No question about it. If the civil service is allowed to work on behalf of the SNP again, like it did in 2014, then, you know, it's not it's not a good thing. It's not a good thing. To put, <clears throat> to put it mildly, to put it mildly. Now, folks, please go to forceforgood.uk forward slash support. Put in your email and we will then be able to contact, to, to keep in touch with you um, with our fortnightly email update, which is so important in keeping you up to date with exactly what we are up to, with what we are up to. So these are the three things that the Scottish Tory leader can do. For starters, sort out the civil service problem, at least make it an issue, make it an issue. Two, build up the Scottish office and do local, if you're going to do local devolution, make sure it's through the Scottish office and not through Holyrood. And thirdly, help to simplify and clarify the funding processes so that we unionists can more effectively argue that case. And this week is, is uh, as many of you know, of course, on our Facebook page regularly, every day, we talk about our British history because our history informs the present, which creates the future. Now, on this day, 8th of August, was the battle uh, against the Spanish Armada. Now, a lot of people would say, Alistair, that's an English thing. That was the English. Well, it was under Queen Elizabeth I, certainly. But imagine if the Armada had won. Scotland would know about it in very short order, okay? The aim of the Spanish Armada was to invade England and convert it to Catholicism. And certainly Scotland would have found out about that intention very quickly. And it would have led to trouble throughout, throughout what we now know as our United Kingdom. So it's very, very relevant British history. British history is anything that has happened from the dawn of time within what we call the British Isles. That can be called British history, regardless of what the politics um, or the regal politics of that day were concerned. So Spanish Armada defeated today back in 1588 and it tried to get away and it sailed right up the side of Scotland, right up the side of the Firth of Forth, round the top of Scotland and down, and a lot of it um, perished on rocks uh, in Ireland, in, in the north coast there of Ireland. So it was almost like the weather that really defeated the Spanish Armada just as much as 
Drake and his fire ships. So that was on the 8th. Also on the 8th, an interesting uh, soldier, which may be posted about that tonight, called James Francis Durham. He died today in uh, 1910. And he had actually been found on a battlefield in the Sudan as an abandoned little baby of two. And he was taken in and he was cared for by the Durham Light Infantry all his life. And the sergeants each month would give, would tithe part of their wage for his upkeep. And they, some really cute pictures on the internet about him and a very interesting story. But unfortunately, when he was 27, he passed away of pneumonia in Ireland while being posted there with the regiment. James was the name of one of the sergeants. Francis was the name of another sergeant. And Durham, of course, for the Durham Light Infantry. Found, found on a bloody battlefield, abandoned on the 30th of December, 1885. On the 9th of August, the Cameroonian War Memorial, which is an amazingly good war memorial at the Kelvin, the Kelvin um, Museum. Um, the Kelvin Grove Art Gallery and Museum. Uh, do check that out. Really fantastic design of World War II Cameroonian soldiers that was opened today by Earl Haig. And that's still there. And um, the Cameroonians, of course, based upon uh, Richard Cameron, the Covenanter. Unfortunately, I disbanded now due to the thoughtlessness of British governments in the past that have not appreciated the importance of local regiments and local affiliations to, to keeping the idea of the United Kingdom together. Um, 11th of August coming up in 1965, the, the Royal Fleet Review in the Clyde was held. Um, this was the last day of it. And there's only been two fleet reviews taking place in Scotland during the reign of Queen Elizabeth. And the last one was on this day uh, near Greenock and Port Glasgow. And there's only one or two pictures on the Internet of, of that. If anybody's got any pictures in their family history of the Clyde fleet review, get it up on the Internet because we've only found like two pictures up there at the moment. But there must be other people with with photographs in the family co collections. So please stick them on the internet. On the 12th of August in uh, 2012, the closing ceremony of the very successful London Olympics, which really did showcase the United Kingdom very well to the world. And of course, we say London 2012, but some of the games were also held in Scotland. There were football games held in in Glasgow, for example, for London 2012. So it it was actually quite a UK wide event and uh, which was which we certainly enjoyed. On the 13th of August, Octavia Hill, the founder of the National Trust and the Army Cadets, she passed away. A woman that many people don't really know of very much, certainly a woman of very small c conservative attitudes um, she loved the outdoors and she said that people want four things they want places to sit in places to play in places to stroll in and places to spend a day in and that was her amazing philosophy which led to her and a couple of other chaps creating the national trust and also the army cadets the Army Cadets was her creation as well, Octavia Hill. And I said she was a woman of quite a small C conservative mind in that she did not believe in giving women the vote. So I wonder how Nicola Sturgeon would would uh, look upon her today. She certainly deserves a statue if there's not one already of her. Also on this day, another great British woman, Florence Nightingale, well, I should say the 13th of August, Florence Nightingale died. Whose, uh, whose, life, whose life has come to embody 
the ideal the ideal of British service to others. And she does have a memorial uh, at the Crimean War Memorial in Waterloo Place in London. On the 14th of August in 1863, one of Britain's greatest fighting men, Field Marshal Colin Campbell from Glasgow, passed away. He joined the British Army at age 16 and saw action in the Peninsula War, the War of 1812, and various other wars uh, throughout the British Empire, including he was the man who led the thin red line of Highlanders, of the 93rd Southern Sutherland Highlanders at the Battle of Balaclava, when 200 kilted Scotsmen repulsed the charge of the Russian cavalry, and it went down in history as the thin red line. Well, that was Colin Campbell, who was the leader of those Highlanders on that line on that day. And he's got a very good statue in George Square. Very good statue there, which was erected in 1868, and he's buried in Westminster Abbey. And on the 14th of uh, August, it's the National Day of one of the British overseas territories. Britain has still got 14 overseas territories, and uh, it's Tristan da Cunha's National Day, which is part of the British overseas territory of St. Helena Ascension and Tristan da Cunha. And it's named after the, the Spaniard who first spotted the island but never landed on it. And it was the British who, who claimed it for the crown in 1816 because they were afraid that the French were going to get it and they were going to try to rescue Napoleon, who was on St. Helena, a neighbouring island, albeit a neighbouring island 1,250 miles away in the Atlantic Ocean, but at least um, better to be safe than to be sorry. And uh, yeah, so that's what we will be covering those things in depth this week in our, on our Facebook page and on our Twitter. And please give us a follow on Facebook because we don't advertise on Facebook anymore. We, we realized that they were playing funny games with us that we would advertise and our followers would rise. And then when we stopped advertising, our followers would all fall back again to the exact same number that we began on. So we don't, we, when we realized that, it took us a month or two to figure out what Facebook was doing. We don't advertise on them anymore, unfortunately, but we, nor do we advertise on Twitter or anything. We, we only gain followers through the uh, ability of our team. And I want to thank the team on Facebook. I know you're watching in today. You're doing great work, guys. Thank you for that. And also for the team on Twitter with whom we could not do what we do. You're absolutely crucial to all of this. And if you want to help us out, please do go to a forceforgood.uk forward slash and donate to, and you can just put in a little bit of cash there just to help us get through because we, uh, we run very frugally, but we do amazing good work amazing good broadcasting and we will be out again doing the street stall at the moment when things just stop getting so crazy when people stop wearing all their masks then we'll be back out there um at the moment it's still an unusual feeling in the the city center but we'll be back out there just as soon as people have generally uh, calmed down again and got back got back to normal and check out our podcast page as well a force for good uk forward slash podcast where every issue that we do here is put into just audio only and some people prefer to do that download a podcast listen to it in the car or whatever uh, so we're and also this will also be put up on youtube as well so you can watch it on youtube and we'll be cutting small videos from this in order to put out during the coming week to direct people to our podcast page and to our YouTube page and to other things like that. So we're keeping the profile of unionism as high as we can 
realistically speaking, at this time. And we can only do it as a result of those people who really do support us and who help us. And I want to say thank you to all of you for doing that. Please stay with us, says, says Brandy. Absolutely. Absolutely. We have every intention of, of doing that. We have every intention of making sure that Scotland stays with us. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, folks. It just remains for me to say now, thank you so much for watching. God bless the United Kingdom. And God save the Queen.